will come to order. We're minus a few members, but um, uh, we have a, a long presentation, and I'm told there are, there are sometimes lots of questions about these things, so I think we'll, uh, we'll get started. We have at the table Spencer Cronk, Commissioner of the Department of Administration, and David Hart, who is, um, uh, among other things, uh, was the architect for a uh, redesign uh, of the Utah Capitol, Correct. and now is working with us um, on our project here. And I think we are, first of all, recognizing Commissioner Cronk. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, my name is Spencer Cronk, the Commissioner for the Department of Administration, and it is a pleasure to be here today um, to give you an overview of the progress and the work that has gone to preserve our great uh, state capitol building. This shouldn't be any news to many of you, but there has been a, a long history of plans and work that has gone into fixing our capital. It's 106 years old, um, I believe, and right. we are in the process of ensuring that we can preserve this building for the next 100 years. Um, there have been plans for 28 years to do a comprehensive restoration uh, effort. Um, all those plans have been not funded, um, not implemented, and I'll just go through a few of those. And it starts in 1984, where the first step towards preservation was a study done on the public spaces of the Capitol building. In 1988, there was a comprehensive preservation plan and implement, implementation strategy that was not completed. In 2001, there was a pre-design update and a pre-design pre for the interior restoration of the Capitol where the recommendations were not implemented. In 2007, there was a pre-design update and conceptual design, but no funding was provided. Then in 2007, a capital restoration working group uh, was established, but no consensus was reached on a restoration strategy. We then shifted in 2008 to do some asset preservation work. Um, if there was no funding and no consensus reached on how to move forward, we had to just start fixing some things in a piecemeal way. And that's basically why you've seen scaffolding around the capital for the last five years. In 2011, a commission was established to address the needs for the capital in a comprehensive way that would prevent us from seeing scaffolding for the next hundred years. I'll talk a little bit about this commission uh, that uh, a number of the members in this committee are a part of. The duties of the commission are to develop a comprehensive multi-year pre-design plan for the restoration of the capital. That plan needed to identify appropriate and required functions of the capital building, to address space requirements for the legislative, executive, and judicial branch, and identify and address the long-term maintenance and, pre uh, and preservation requirements of the Capitol building. In developing that plan, the commission needed to take into account the rules governing zoning, citizen access, IT needs, energy efficiency, security, education programs, including public school tours, and any additional space needs for the efficient operations of state government. You see that the members of the commission listed in, uh, as they were in 2012. I just want to little, talk a little bit about the work that these members of the commission um, did in the first two years in its existence. And members, I'll just interrupt for a minute. I think we'll, we'll uh, entertain questions as we go along, uh, should there be one on the slide rather than wait till the end. So uh, we'll be watching for it. Absolutely. Um, they started out by creating three guiding principles that would dictate the work going forward. It was important to establish these because uh, it's often easy to lose track of the scope and range of the project and you need some guiding principles to go back to. These three principles were agreed on unanimously by the commission itself um, and they included architectural integrity, the building function, and the life safety and security of the building. Um, I hope that you all agree with these as well as they are three of the most important things that really should dictate the work going forward of the preservation of the Capitol building. The Commission also looked at past studies and updated the findings which were included in their 2012 report. The findings are indicative and, and... And members, this slide you don't find in your packet, and so the ones that they've added, and I think they were as a result of questions yesterday in the Senate. Yes. And so the ones that they've added, we will copy and, and get to you, and, and this is one of the ones you don't have. 
And, that, and thank you, Madam Chair. And I think it was important for us to provide a little bit more background information for this committee as there are a number of new members um, to talk about the findings that have existed in the Capitol building itself. So these findings um, have been documented through those past studies and also were updated by the commission itself. But the stone exterior is deteriorating rapidly. The mechanical systems are nearing the end of their useful life. They have maintenance issues. There's no direct source of outside air in the rotunda. The plumbing systems are at risk of leaking. And much of the plumbing system is not accessible. And then the electrical systems are inadequately sized. They also found that life safety systems need to be improved. The Capitol doesn't have any smoke control systems. There's limited sprinkler systems. The exit stairwells are not code compliant. The security design and technology to mitigate security vulnerabilities. The Capitol really needs to be safe for all Minnesota citizens and its uh, legislative members. The technology systems need to be improved. We were joking that when we were giving our Senate presentation yesterday, we were interrupted for about five, 10 minutes because the technology wasn't working. And so um, it, it's clear that there's a, a couple different uh, 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 backbone issues on the infrastructure and the networks that the, that the capital is under right now. Um, and it, uh, from these findings, the, the systems were clear, the technology systems were a clear need for improvement. The accessibility is inadequate or non-existent. And 100 years ago, uh, the accessibility for the disabled was not considered, and we need to modernize that uh, building for that. And then finally, the uh, additional key findings were in committee rooms, that they need to be better organized. Uh, the public struggles to find legislators located in the Capitol. The accommodations for visitors should be improved. Communication between the Senate and House chamber uh, needs to be supported uh, more effectively. And that the restoration should be a 100-year effort to really look at the life expectancy of that building for the next uh, century. The commission then approved unanimously a comprehensive master plan that covered uh, the restoration from 2012 to 2017 and then maintenance and stewardship for the next 20 years on. That approval um, was given in January of 2012, and it provided that conceptual approach to the restoration. And it came at a budget of $241 million, with a substantial completion date in December 2016. In addition, there was also a, a $6.6 .6 million uh, need identified to build a tunnel under University Avenue before and I'll uh, interrupt once light rail came in. They just went backward in your presentation, so they're back on page six in your packet, just in case. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> This initial appropriation of $44 million was given to the Department of Administration in 2012 to basically begin the restoration effort. Um, that $44 million uh, was used to construct that tunnel uh, because if we didn't do that tunnel then, it would be cost prohibitive uh, after light rail came in. And that tunnel was a recommendation of an ad hoc security committee uh, that ensured that we were able to address some high-risk security needs of the capital complex. The appropriation also uh, provided for the capital restoration pre-design and design, the repairs to the exterior stone, and bid package number one for mechanical and attic space. I'll talk briefly about the, the, the ability to get the, 20, the $44 million uh, in last year's legislative session um, allowed us to get the project team together. And the, the, the process for assembling this team was important because we wanted to make sure that the construction manager, the architect, and the program manager, and the project representative were all at the table early on in this process so we could make sure that we were staying within the scope and the budget of the project itself. Um, so that uh, procurement for these uh, the project team members was completed in October and they've been working on workshops which David Hart will talk to you about in a minute. So I'm going to now introduce David Hart uh, who is from the design team MOCA and he is the vice president there but also served as the executive director for the restoration of the state capital of, the, of Utah. And so he'll give a little bit of background about himself and then continue with the presentation. Well, Thank you. Committee. Um, and I think there might be a question uh, from Representative Earhart before we 
move ahead here. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just you mentioned security. Is there any? I guess you built a tunnel to nowhere. Uh, what security is that? But anyway, uh, is there were there other securities? Items thought of as we restructure the capital here? Commissioner Crock. Sure. Just to address the tunnel itself, there was a, a clear security risk in having materials that, uh, trucks that would be delivering materials that would back right up to the Capitol building. And so it was important to have them unload their materials across the street and then bring them through the tunnel itself. So that was the primary security risk that we were dealing with. Mm -hmm. Follow up. Um, Earhart, follow up. Well, I, Madam Chair, I was just wondering if there's, we don't have any security at the Capitol right now for all of us. There could be a guy come in that door right now. and So I was wondering uh, that would be adverse to our, our good gathering here. Yep. And uh, so I was just wondering if anything, given uh, what is happening in the world, if any other considerations were taking it when you were doing your reconstruction and remodeling here. Mr. Croft. That's it. Madam Chair, Representative, that's a great question, and um, I'll address that in two ways. One, uh, David Hart, through the workshops that he'll be describing uh, that he's been conducting over the past few months, uh, certainly has been uh, addressing security in one of those workshops, and we've been working closely with the Department of Public Safety um, and others that uh, care about the security of the Capitol. The second is that there was a separate committee established last legislative session that's chaired by the Lieutenant Governor and includes representation from legislative branch and from the Department of Public Safety as well. They are issuing, uh, they have issued now a separate set of recommendations to address security on the Capitol. We are certainly including those and they're being integrated into the Comprehensive Restoration Plan. Thank you. Mr. Hart, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, uh, David Hart. I'm the uh, former uh, executive director of the Capital Preservation Board for the state of Utah and the architect of the Utah State Capitol. And I am now a vice president with MOCA, who has been retained by your state to act as the owner's uh, program manager and overseeing the coordinating the uh, activities of the uh, restoration and working directly with the legislature and with the tenants in the in the capital. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning and and uh, look forward to a good discussion with regards to the the work that we have been doing. What I would like to do is take a, a few minutes and, and talk about the work that has uh, proceeded since the approval of the master plan in in 2012 and uh, talk a little bit about why we're, we're doing that. We're modeling the process after the process we used in Salt Lake City on the Utah State Capitol. That project uh, was about 273 million. It involved the uh, complete restoration of the Utah State Capitol and the base isolation of that building. It was uh, driven by a seismic requirement where your project is really driven by maintain, uh, upgrading and improving the mechanical and electrical systems and halting some of the deterioration that is uh, going on within the building. Um, we also added two additional buildings and redid the entire um, um, uh, grounds uh, work and restored that. We were able to do that under budget and on time. And so we're using that similar model here. One of the things we did in Utah was to create a set of design guidelines and then move through a series of design scoping workshops, which I will uh, walk you through. Um, in 2012, September, we met with the Capital Preservation Commission and we spent some time with them talking about some very high level design guideline issues. Following that, we met with um, three other meetings where we met with tenants and users of the Capitol to understand how they used the building, to understand the, the issues related to using the building, how it was working, how it wasn't working, where the pitfalls were. We then talked with the technology folks and the communication folks, and we learned that there were several backbones that are running through the, the Capitol and creating a variety of issues and a variety of problems that need to be addressed. Uh, we spent time studying the details of the building and how Cass Gilbert designed the building, how he put it together, what his, what his guiding principles were and trying to understand some of those things. And then we spent a great deal of time studying your systems and trying to understand the mechanical system, the electrical system, communication systems, life safety systems, and so on. Um, and all of these guidelines, we developed over 34 guidelines that will be given to the architect and used in these design scoping workshops. 
Now you can go to the website that you see on the, the paper in front of you and project it and there you'll be able to identify and, and read each one of the guidelines and leave comments. We've set up a website where you can actually review those things, leave your comments, tell us if we missed the mark or if you think we're on, on, uh, on the mark, I guess. Um, and so we were able to uh, receive those concepts. The design guidelines are set up using a couple of important elements. First of all, we've numbered each idea. We've tried to keep the ideas very succinct and very clear. So uh, you'll see there's a mechanical idea that is numbered 19, hierarchy is number two. Uh, and those ideas then are described both in text, because some people understand things very well by reading, and in imagery. Um, because we try to tie the visual to the text so that we get a very clear picture. We want to communicate clearly to the architects and to the contractors those things that the, uh, the individuals on Capitol Hill felt were, were important. We then take those design guidelines and we work those into a series of design scoping workshops. So all 34 guidelines were, were then combined into a number of uh, workshops and so we are holding 11 workshops. The ones that are highlighted in green are the ones that we have already completed. So we've gone through historic preservation and uh, security, uh, caucus and, and uh, hearing rooms, and we'll give you a brief summary on each of those in just a moment. The ones that are not highlighted in greens are, are the ones that we're still working on and, and we have some uh, additional work to continue doing. We are working this week, for example, on office space. Um, Again, you can read the findings and you can read the summary documents on the website that uh, is provided. So our second design scoping workshop was on historic preservation. And during the historic preservation, we identified the four different restoration zones that we'll be working with. Um, you will notice that um, the red is the highest preservation zone and the, uh, the yellow is the second and the, uh, the green then is the third, and, and I'll describe those in just a moment. And we also then zone the exterior uh, where the rotunda has the highest and then we move, move out so the, the, the same. So the findings were that the zone one was the highest sensitivity where we have the greatest amount of historic fabric left. These are the public spaces, these are the areas of the chambers and some of the historic spaces that are still very much intact, and so those zones we want to preserve and we don't want to change. We want to make sure that, that they are held um, uh, sacred, so to speak. Uh, zone two are transitional spaces where there is still a great deal of historic fabric and we would like to see those zones restored to what they once were, but there has been some transition, there has been some change, and so we want to treat those very carefully. The zone three spaces, which are the green spaces, are the ones that have the most flexibility because a lot of the historic fabric has been lost or has been removed. And those are primarily the areas where you see the offices and the working parts of the building. And then zone four is largely the basement and the lower levels of the capital, which didn't exist originally and has been added over time. And so that's where the greatest amount of flexibility can be seen. Um, in, our, in our workshop number three, we started to look at the mechanical, electrical, and structural systems of the building. Um, these uh, primarily were to repair, replace, and restore the systems. And we were looking at the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, communications, and security systems so that we would have a clear understanding of all of the different issues related to the building system so that we could overlay those onto what we found with regards to the historic structures elements. Um, we identified three basic approaches. Now, these came from a understanding of trying to keep the building functioning while we were restoring it. We had been asked by the Capital Preservation Commission to try to keep the building open as much as possible uh, except for the areas obviously where we're doing the work. And that required us to try to figure out a way to utilize the mechanical systems that are in the building while we're putting in new mechanical systems at the same time. So the first system we looked at was moving all of the mechanical systems to the attic space. And that proved to be a little bit too prohibitive with regards to cost and some efficiencies. 
And so we then looked at an up-down system, which included some on the, in the attic and some in the, the basement. Uh, again, as you might imagine, that also had some, some issues with regards to efficiencies and to cost. And so the recommendation that we um, finally arrived at was that we would put 100% of the mechanical system in the basement and pull the fresh air that is needed for makeup air um, off of the roof and um, utilize that. Um, and so after going through and studying that, the mechanical systems will be located in the basement. This is the least expensive and most uh, efficient system. Fresh air, as I mentioned, will come off the roof. The one of the benefits that we did find throughout the um, analysis is that the electrical closets and the electrical um, rooms, which would typically be located on each floor, and these rooms would be anywhere between 10 by 10 and 10 by 15 based on using a uh, 480 volt system uh, would take up quite a bit of space on each floor. We're able to locate those both in the attic and in the basement, thereby eliminating them from the floors and being able to maintain the usable space for other functional aspects. And then we um, studied the plumbing systems and we realized that Cass Gilbert, um, back in the day, uh, placed one public restroom on each floor, thereby uh, alternating men's and women's from floor to floor. This has created a number of problems for people as they try to find a restroom and they realize they either have to go up or down a floor to, to utilize that. So we will be providing uh, one additional restroom on each floor, one for men and one for women will be on each floor now, so there will be parity with regards to that. We will also be providing a um, what's known as a family or a unisex restroom. Um, in many situations, as people who are disabled need to use a restroom, they may need to have somebody help them, and this is a little more private and provides a little bit more dignity. And so we have overlaid those onto the, the plan as well. Our fourth workshop focused on vertical transportation. And uh, uh, one of the things that we were faced with is how do we deal with an emergency exit? Uh, we had a requirement that we move people out of the building during a, an emergency. Uh, our first analysis showed that we needed five new stairs. Uh, you can imagine what that would do to the building if we were to add five <laughs> new uh, exit stairs. There wouldn't be much space left to do much else but exit the building. Um, and so we went yeah, through. Yes. Point. Um, when um, when our city uh, re uh, renovated or remodeled the uh, landmark center, saved that building. Um, what I recall that they said is because it was a historic building, um, codes, building codes that might normally, uh, uh, you know, new construction or something, wouldn't apply to a building like that. What what did you find about the capital in terms of? exemptions from building codes because it is a historic building. Right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, the building codes do have an exemption. You are all allowed to use the existing stairs um, based on certain um, premises or principles, such as egress and is it a safe egress. So, for example, we went through and looked at a variety of different options and utilizing the building. The, uh, the, the stair that is in the back on the north side, which is the elliptical stair, can be fully utilized as an exit stair. The main stairs in the central portion of the building can be used as a portion because we do not have a handrail down the center and we don't intend to place a handrail down the center. We're able to use a portion of those stairs to help offset that. And then there are other stairs that we can also use in the building, which eliminates the number of five down to one. So the, the, the code then requires us to put in one new, new stair. Now, we are going to continue looking at that and trying to study that and see if there's a way to deal with that. But we would be, at this point, with our initial review, looking at one stair. Um, the elevator systems in the buildings are slow and a little bit antiquated, as I'm sure you have realized as you move over there and try to take the elevators up to the different floors. Part of that has to do with the way they are positioned in the elevator shafts currently. We have two in one shaft and one in another shaft. The two that are side by side are very close together. They can't run at full speed and they're small. Uh, what we're proposing is that we 
put one elevator in where there are two elevators and then uh, improve the speed of both the elevators on the south side and then add a third elevator as it's close to the um, tunnel that is coming through from the north side. That, I, I hope that might be clear. I, I, I see maybe some questions in your mind as to what we're doing. So if, if there are any, maybe we ought to pause there just for a minute. Uh, Representative Mahoney. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm trying to visualize in my mind where that particular third elevator shaft would go. Right uh, to the chambers. <laughs> no, no, we've well, avoided the As long as it's through the Senate chambers, we're cool. Um, um, oh, I shouldn't say that. I'll just get get a senator mad at me. I'll, I'll talk to you a little more about that later. I, I have another thing to add about that. Mr. Hart. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, the, the elevators, if, if, you, if you think about where the new tunnel is coming into the, the Capitol, it comes into a corner on the north west side of the Capitol, just below that parking area. So in that corner where those doors are that come into the building there, the elevator would be just to the west of those doors because that would tie then into the, the tunnel down below. One of the benefits of tying that to the tunnel that has just come in is it would be able to then take the materials that come off the truck at the loading dock bring them over to the building and rather than roaming them all the way through the building to get to the elevators on the south side of the building, they would be able to then go up the elevators on the north side, or the elevator on the north side. Um, so that is, is why we're positioning it in that. Oh, so it would be, it would be close to the rat scaler. That, that was my question. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Hart. Okay, thank you. So we're proposing that there would be three elevators. This would, uh, after talking to our elevator consultant, would increase the ability for members in the House and the Senate to move vertically much quicker, as well as members of the uh, public, as well as staff. So we, we feel as though that would, would help resolve that. The stair and the elevator, we're also thinking, would be combined in the new area so that we could take advantage of that vertical circulation. And the, the one thing that should be mentioned, the uh, Attorney General staff have, um, have I think, continued uh, to have discussion with you because in their space there would be three staircases that would that is some of their space, and they are resisting that a bit, feeling that that uh, somehow uh, is excessive. And so I think that's an issue that, yes. that they're still in discussion. Yes, and we're, Madam Chair, we're, we're working through that with them. And hopefully, we'll find a solution. Sure. Representative Mahoney. Uh, Madam Chair, and I, I, and maybe you've done this, but having looked at the old prints, uh, Cass Gilbert's original prints, uh, not a copy of the original prints, we had a variety of other departments from ag, uh, veterans. I think there was five different departments that were housed in the Capitol building. Do you have a? Have you looked at the history of? how those have been moved out, and uh, maybe we should take a look at the, um, the resistance of those particular departments and how that was handled, because I, I don't want to imply that an attorney, uh, something against an attorney, particularly the state attorney general, but maybe uh, there are other places for that. And, part of her staff. And this might be a, a good place for me to share a little bit of the past history, too. Um, I can tell you we're a House committee, so this is uh, uh, among uh, friends in the House. There was always resistance on the part of, um, of House members, particularly as that price tag went up and up. Um, if we felt that uh, because the senators were in that building and they were approached and at the table uh, perhaps a little more and were devising Senate wish lists, which whenever I hear that right now, I, I get a little nervous too. Um, we have a lot of interest in historic preservation. We certainly want the mechanicals to work and safety and all of that. We weren't terribly interested in uh, making offices and hearing rooms somehow uh, improved or because we thought it is a historic building. And we believed that if you really need more office and hearing room space, 
it would be much cheaper to do that in a new building than to try to, to recreate that kind of thing. Because there was, at one point, an idea to push the front steps of the Capitol out and build an auditorium underneath it. They're going to get to that issue of, of larger hearing rooms later. So there was always a little resistance, and you'll see in a few pages when it says Senate media voiced a strong desire to remain in the Capitol, um, where, where we had a conversation about should there really be uh, a press room in both the state office building and the Capitol, we have a wonderful Room 181. Shouldn't that just be our only press room for press conferences? Now that's when senators and press would say, well, gosh, we'd have to walk across the street. Well, as House members <laughs> who walk across the street several times every day, we weren't terribly sympathetic with that. So there was a little bit of, in this number of years uh, process, tension between House and Senate um, and a different point of view about that. And I, I think I just give that as historic background, lest you think all of this went smoothly. Um, there, has, there has certainly been uh, something of a different point of view that the House and Senate have had. And um, if you remember uh, Representative Maury Lanning, who used to feel that we weren't asking the state to do the same thing that we, for example, expect from Minsky about their space planning. Way at the beginning, we had thought there should be a campus plan, we, we, that we shouldn't look at the capital in isolation. Um, and uh, what I understand is there will have to be people who move out of the capital as a result of this. Really? And, and those are the kinds of transitions that I suspect won't be easy. So just, just a little um, background uh, to that particular. Yes. Representative Earhart has it. Uh, on this uh, subject, uh, Madam Chair, uh, was there any consideration uh, given to housing all of the Senate over there? Mm -hmm. That's one of, one of the conversations. Okay, so they're still thinking about that. We, if we knew where they all were, we could keep more tra better track of them. <laughs> uh, Mr. Hart, I think we're with that okay. little uh, digression. <laughs> Madam Chair and, and members, thank you. Um, just to that point, um, we, we have gone back and we have looked at the history of the Capitol. And as you know, at, at one time, most every office in state government was housed in the Capitol. And, it seems like over a period of 20 to 25 years, there, there seems to be some kind of a change and then a, a, a group moves out or they create a new building or something happens. So we have analyzed that. Um, we have looked in general at the site and we do believe that there is space and locations that if it was the desire of the legislature to create a new building, that there is space and there are locations that those could go to. Um, to your point, Madam Chair, that um, I do believe that as we go through this exercise, we will identify a variety of options for what may eventually move out of the Capitol. Um, I, I don't have that information today. We're in the process of, of doing that. But it could be a variety, a wide variety of different things from everything from A to Z. And so we are, we are looking at that. We're looking at it openly. And we will provide that information as we, we arrive on that. Representative Carlson. Yeah, um, Madam Chair, first of all, just a comment for some that um, haven't had a chance to look at the history of the Capitol. Uh, a lot of those hearing rooms with two, to, two entrances, uh, they were remodeled, and that's where a lot of those state agencies were housed. Those were um, divided. But I was just going to add to the Chair's comments that uh, part of that discussion with that uh, major uh, remodeling that was talked about was whether we would surrender uh, house space in the Capitol as well. You know, we do have, uh, under uh, historical agreements, parts of the Capitol that are designated as house space. <clears throat> and uh, when they wanted to move the uh, senators so that they would all be in the building, that raised some serious questions as to what our role in the Capitol would be or continue to be. Um, if it's all right, uh, before we leave uh, the mechanical, <clears throat> I was going to ask, uh, if there's ever been any information provided uh, relative to what the energy savings would be. You've referenced uh, several times more efficiency. Um, I was just at the uh, dedication a few months ago of the uh, remodeling, if you will, or reconstruction of a hockey rink uh, in my district. And the energy savings were such that um, the debt service on that uh, remodeling was virtually covered by the energy savings. Now, hockey rinks are very expensive to operate. 
<clears throat> but I have a feeling a capital building, as old as it is, there must be potential savings that would be just huge when you talk about a new uh, mechanical system, new windows, and right. all of that. Right. Mr. Hart, are you the <clears throat> Yes, I can, I can um, answer that, and if we need to go into it a little further, we can, we can talk to Wayne um, Wozlowski. Um, Madam Chair and, and uh, Representative, the, um, the project will be restored following the state requirement now that we um, upgrade all the mechanical systems to what I believe is referred to as B3, which is the, the guideline that they have, which is a significant uh, improvement over the energy code. Um, I can't tell you today exactly what the energy savings will be, but we are very focused on how we're going to reduce energy and how we're going to accomplish those things. And I know the mechanical engineers have been uh, working through those things and part of the discussions that we were having with regards to where to locate the system was how do we drive some of those savings. Okay, thank you. Continue. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> so the, uh, the findings with regards to the uh, vertical circulation and access were that um, while the code requires five stairs, we will be seeking the exemptions and trying to limit that down to a minimum of one, and if we can eliminate that one stair, we will, we will try and do that as well. Um, the elevator service can be improved by um, going to two larger, faster elevators on the south and one large elevator in the northwest corner. Accessibility from the parking to the buildings will be through the uh, south ground floor as currently um, exists. Now this is regarding the dis disabled. Uh, we spent some time with the, the various folks um, who approach the building from a wheelchair standpoint and uh, the ground floor under the port cocher on the south side is, is currently set up for accessibility. We studied that and, and their preference is to not have a mechanical lift. We, we talked about a possibly changing that a little bit and uh, restoring those three exit doors and entry doors. However, you would have to put in a mechanical lift. The problem with mechanical lifts is they break and they're not as reliable and so they wanted to make sure that there was a clear path and a ramp system so that on any given day regardless of whether the mechanical lift is working or not they would have the ability to access that. So we will maintain that access because we think that that is the, the most appropriate place for them. The one issue that we do have is that the cross slope of the access ways on the outside of the building will need to be addressed and we think we can do that by adding a sidewalk that uh, works more with the grade and then lands down where the parking would be. So we think we have a solution there. And then there would be a secondary accessible route which would come in from the east possibly through a mechanical area that is uh, located on the ground floor that would have to be changed to an entrance and then would come into the uh, ground floor hall which is currently possibly is currently being used by um, the legislative council and, and some of the research functions that we might have to change. Representative Norton. Thank you. This is uh, more about aesthetics here. I, um, as you're looking and I'm back at the elevator, the photos that you have on here, kind of the beautiful historic elevator doors and how beautiful yes. that was to what is now quite I don't want to Metal. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, utilitarian. And so I, I'm wondering, are, is there an effort along with the, just the practical use to really restore that, that front as well? Mr. Hart. Yes, uh, Madam Chair and Representative, thank you for asking that question. Um, our plan on the south elevators would be to restore the glass fronts. Um, part of the, the building's original lighting came through those entry points, those elevator areas. Um, when those um, walls were changed to a metal and solid material, the lighting inside the building changed dramatically. And if you walk through the Capitol, you'll notice that they had to move some of the torchair lighting, which are the lights that are on the columns, um, around so that they could accommodate that, plus they had to add some sconce lighting. We believe that by going back and adding the arched glass, adding the glass fronts, we've also talked to the elevator um, inspectors uh, who come out and inspect, and they have given us direction that we can put glass elevators in those openings front and back with solid sides and, and try to replicate the grill work that would have been on the um, 
original elevators. You can't have a grill because you can't stick your hand through it. it today it would not meet code. But what you can do is laminate glass and then put a grill over the glass. We utilize that process in Salt Lake and the elevators are, are very nice to look at and much more historic and, and sympathetic to the overall building. And so that's the direction we're, we're pursuing right now. It is a little bit more money, obviously, to put in the glass, but I think it'll add a great deal to the light and the aesthetic quality of the, the building. So thank, thank you for you. asking that question. Thank you, and I agree completely. I, I think, you know, part of historic preservation is bringing back some of the things we've lost, and I think that would be, I, I would welcome that change. Thanks. Ward. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Mr. Hart, thank you for, uh, I want to go back to the disability access. Uh, um, and and I, I was struck uh, once uh, a few years ago, I don't remember exactly when it was, by a constituent of mine that was with a group here that was visiting and, and lobbying me. And, and there was, uh, one, of the, one of my constituents was, was in a wheelchair and complained about access, not, not in SOB, but over at the, at the Capitol. And, and that's, that has stuck with me um, for a long time, obviously. And you know, I know that, and I'm thankful that we worked hard to make everything handicap accessible as possible um, in all buildings. Um, and I know that uh, even in my own district, I have dealt with some issues, uh, some handicap accessibility issues, and, and some of the organizations that, that I've dealt with have said, okay, here's what we're going to do. And then, and, then, um, and then the disability community comes in and says, you know, thank you, but that's not exactly how we need it. Okay, so my question to you is: Have you um, have you communicated and talked with the disability community itself in your um, in your um, moving forward with this plan, Mr. Hart? Uh, Madam Chair and Representative, um, yes, very closely. We have been working a, a great deal with Margot and with Joan um, uh, from both of those organizations. We we also have meetings set up. Uh, in two weeks where we will meet with uh, the, the blind and the hard of hearing as well as the other groups and talk through some of those things and we have meetings set up in I think it's four weeks. So we're, we're meeting with them, um, uh, I don't want to say consistently, but um, we have met with them through the, the space planning, we met with them through the, um, the discussion with regards to the committee rooms and the access and the uh, the movement vertically. Also, we involve them in the discussion with the restrooms, and we will continue to dis uh, discuss things with them. One of the things that um, they would like to see us try and do is pr go a little bit further than what is considered code required. Um, and so we are trying to make as many accommodations for those things as possible. Um, we have looked at the, the chambers and how to get access for the chambers. We have looked at the uh, Supreme Court chamber and how to get access to that. And so we're, we're, we're working through a lot of those issues. Back when Cass Gilbert designed the building, there was obviously no consideration for the accessibility issues for the disabled or the handicapped. And so we are doing everything we can to try to maintain the historic elements of Cass Gilbert's design but at the same time integrate the, uh, the handicap Thank issues. Representative Mahoney. Oh, did, did you have, uh, uh, Commissioner Cronk, did you have more to add to that? Just a, a quick comment, Madam Chair. Uh, for both of these last two questions, I think it's important to just note that what's different about this planning process is that we've been able to engage everyone who wants to be a part of that conversation and have specifically reached out to those that we, need, that we know need to be a part of that conversation. So both with the disabilities community, the historical society, uh, the Capital Area Preservation Board. I mean, all these players are critical to um, have that input and engagement in these workshops. Um, two things here, it's kind of a comment, and it's surprising that Cass Gilbert, this, the building was built kind of as a celebration of the Civil War veterans, and with the amount of damage done during that war to the veterans, it's surprising that he did not <laughs> include some, uh, but that's the thinking of the 1900s. <clears throat> I've been involved in a couple of restorations, both on the commercial end of it and my 100-year-old house, which continues to be restored, <laughs> and the amount of aspirins that I've taken over that has become larger and larger. I've never been involved uh, or been in a building that, where they've tried to restore the elevators. Um, and, but I know the difficulties of elevator installation and 
um, there are many jobs in construction that I would love to try. Elevator installation and service is not one of them ever. Um, has one ever been done like like what you're proposing, where you put glass in the front and the back and and, and bring back that uh, grill work of sorts? Uh, because every time you do a historical preservation and you do it the first time, uh, the cost is much greater. <clears throat> uh, um, so kind of has that ever been done, and do you know what the the difference would be in, in cost from uh, kind of a designed elevator that would look appropriate in a historic building versus really restoring it to the Cass Gilbert kind of glory that it right. was intended to. Improve functionality versus historic accuracy. Yes. Uh, Mr. Hart. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative. Um, yes, we have um, studied that um, quite extensively, and I appreciate your question. Uh, we first saw a glass elevator concept that um, has had tried to do that in San Francisco Post Office, where they had gone in and restored that. The, um, the old elevators used a grill system that would pass in front of one another. Today, because of the smoke issues and because of the ventilation issues, and, and we know that vertical spaces act as chimneys during a fire, we can't have that open elevator. But we can use glass as the elevator doors. And you're seeing more and more glass elevators in airports and in a variety of new modern buildings. Um, what is typically done is that it's a lamination process where you laminate the glass and the metal together in, in a, in a process. We use that in two elevators in Utah uh, to restore the historic appearance of that. It was a uh, more costly um, endeavor uh, because of it's, it's non-typical. It worked very well. Um, we have been working with the cost estimator who is part of J.E. Dunn, the CM, and they have provided us with a cost. I don't have that number off the top of my head. But I think for the two elevators that we're looking at is roughly around $100,000 uh, for both elevators. That includes the glass above and the glass below and the glass inside. Now, that may go up or down depending on the various fire ratings that we have to get through as we go through the process and we involve the building official as well as the, code, uh, the elevator uh, inspectors. But those type of things we, we can work through. So, yes, we, we do have some some experience in, in putting those together. Thank you. Representative Lilly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, was there any discussion as far as, and I'm sorry I stepped out for a few minutes and maybe it came up, but uh, on that front patio area on the second floor and reopening that or opening it, uh, it's just such a missed opportunity, I feel, uh, with the wonderful vistas of the mall area and the cathedral and St. Paul and uh, and just, uh, you know, I think just for mental health, to be able to get outside of the building, you know, with the, on the second floor with having, without having to go down the steps and get out and just to have a space. And it's just such a missed opportunity to me in my mind to have that, you know, quite often now step out in our retiring room into the little patio. I don't smoke, but I'll go out there and just to, you know, realize it's spring perhaps or something you know right at, towards the end of session but uh i would just be curious to hear if uh there's any opportunities that we could open up it just it just seems like what you know an amazing treasure that we could have there you know to to have that area and just to be able to get outside and the you know with the vistas and on and on and on sure so. mr hart um madam chair and representative uh thank you for the question um we have, we have looked at that a number of times and we're continuing to look at it. Um, um, the opportunity is um, one that we need to um, understand with a variety of different um, restrictions and codes that are in place. Um, first of all, it is approximately um, 12 to 18 inches, if I recall, higher than the, the main floor. Uh, a handicapped accessible ramp is uh, 
for every one inch you go vertically, you have to have 12 inches horizontally. So that would require an 18-foot ramp. Um, how to put that in that space is is a real struggle and a real challenge, and and so that that is the first issue. The second issue is that um, back in the day when Cass Gilbert was designing these um, this building, uh, the requirements for both the height of the handrails or the the railings, and the and the distance of the vertical elements within them were, were much different. Today, I believe the code is you can't allow a three-inch ball to pass through. I think we can pass a six-foot ball or a child through some of these things. Um, and the railings are much lower. And so we are faced with a couple of issues. One, how do we modify the rail to make it safe, or do we modify the rail to make it safe? And how do we deal with the accessibility issues? We are um, in the process of restoring those areas, going to restore the, the walking surface, and there will be new doors, and uh, the, the windows will be restored. The, the question is, how do we handle these other things? Now, there is the exemption in the code that the Madam Chair brought up, and we will be working with that to try to understand that. But it's a, it's a hard issue, especially when it's out in a public area. Some of the areas that are for example, behind the Supreme Court coming off of the deliberation room, that's a little different because it's a private area. And so we need to kind of look at those and, and understand that. We haven't come to any final decision, although I, I will say that from a pure code standpoint, it's complicated. But nice. there was a lot of assent around the, the table when you raised that issue, right. I think. It's, it's a wonderful space, and I, I think a lot of the architects would agree that it would be nice to utilize. We just aren't sure yet how to really do it and not muck it up in the process. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the, the, the comments and the, the interest. I, I really think it would really, it, it's a missed opportunity and um, would really enhance the quality of life for uh, the citizenry and the members as we deliberate the issues of Minnesota, <laughs> if you will. Continue. Yeah. Thank you. Um, our, our fifth workshop was the uh, hearing rooms and, and technology. Um, the, 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 the opportunity to provide a fiber backbone, one fiber backbone, and then have the other um, networks and backbones come off of that is very, very real, and I think it's a great opportunity. And we have met with the technology folks from both the House and the Senate the administration and, and others, and everybody feels as though it's doable. We have to make sure that there are adequate firewalls and adequate protections in place so that information is not compromised, and, and uh, we will be working very closely with the uh, various technology folks to make sure that that, uh, that happens. Uh, regarding hearing rooms, some of the things that we have heard um, with re, uh, regards to those is that they're inadequate in the capital. They have limited to uh, poor technology. As you uh, heard, we had a little problem over there uh, yesterday with some computers and, and making things work. Um, and also the, the size they find when there are large issues, they have a hard time accommodating uh, folks. And so there has been a request for a variety of different sizes. And you can see in your handout that they range from 75 to 250. Um, this is one of the areas that, as we have studied and, and looked at, will most likely not fit in the capital and would be a candidate for some additional space in, in some other location. Um, we think it's probably something that may be needed uh, on, cap on the capital grounds up here to have some larger auditorium possibly sized seating areas for the public, but we don't see a space in the capital that is really going to accommodate that at a budget or a price that is really going to be affordable. So what we found is that the existing rooms struggle with technology and, and visibility. They have columns in the, in the way, and, and we're going to have to try to work through those. The number of hearing rooms and sizes are difficult to accommodate in the, in the capital, and so we're looking at different options. And the ability to add large hearing rooms um, in the basement, somehow the word exists got reduced in size, and I apologize for that. It, it exists, but it exists at a, at a pretty healthy cost. We looked at three major locations. 
The first we looked at was under the south stairs, and you can imagine what that cost might be. It's in the millions to tear down the south stairs, to dig a hole, to put the uh, hearing room below the stairs, and then to restructure that hearing room so that you can carry the weight of those stairs and put them back. That we felt like was excessive and, and was not going to be affordable. We looked at the west stairs, and um, as you may recall, they have just been taken out and replaced. Now, that's a little less expensive, but nonetheless very expensive to remove those and put something in, in there, and so we're not recommending that. The one area that a committee room could go is to the east. Uh, it would not require demolishing the stairs. It would not require tearing out the plaza. There is, a head significant, there is sufficient head height in the east side, and you could locate a medium and a maybe two medium committee rooms over in that corner if that was the decision. But we think that those are the only, the only areas at this point in time that um, hearing rooms could be accommodated. And then the communication systems can certainly be reduced from the six or eight various backbones down to one and, and try to work through that. Uh, currently, we are going through a space planning and, and swing space analysis, trying to understand what people do, how they do it, how much space they really need, and, and some of those things we have met with the the Senate and the Secretary of the Senate. We have met with the House and the Chief Clerk of the House to try to understand those things. We've met with the Supreme Court, and as you heard, we met with the Attorney General, the Governor's Office, Public Safety, the Historical Society, and others uh, to make sure that we understand the, the various processes that, that go on in the Capitol. We are in the process right now of developing a series of overlays, and we have identified a number of conflicts, a number of growth issues, a number of um, just general planning issues that we're trying to work through. We don't really have any findings at this point in time to share with you. We will, however, be happy to share those as we, we see those. Um, and so the, the next item I, I'd like to chat with is schedule unless you have questions. Well, uh, just that uh, before we move into the future, because you've been telling what has happened, I think um, uh, we, we should acknowledge, um, because Representative Erdahl is um, a member of our committee, um, there are a, a lot of people who have worked hard, but I think in the last few years to actually move forward and, and get some money in a bill, uh, Representative Erdahl has, um, has been a driving force, and we can remember those of us who were present last year uh, remember his floor speeches holding parts of the Capitol in his hands. And uh, so we just um, want, wanted to acknowledge that all of the work you've just talked about um, is, is uh, in, in, uh, a significant part to leadership such as Representative Riddles. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I thank you for those remarks and uh, the person who re probably remembers my floor speech the best is former Representative Maserell who was sitting next to me as I held <laughs> the in my hand and my hand started to quiver. I've got a very nice picture of him staring up with fear in his eyes. But thank you very much for those words. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, <coughs> Have you uh, talked about restoring the House chambers to their original uh, configuration with the, uh, the galley in front and so forth? We have, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and uh, Representative. We have spent uh, a lot of time looking at the House chamber. Uh, we understand that there are some uh, issues related to having a gallery behind the, the speaker. Um, we are not contemplating at this point in time changing that mural and that uh, uh, piece of art that is above the, the speaker's areas now and going back to that. That area has probably got a better use at this point as the, the space and, and the functions that are occurring. Um, while we also think that there may need to be some adjustments and minor modifications to the gallery so that we have more accessibility for the disabled as well as more accessibility for those uh, members of the public who want to participate in, in watching you do that. Um, we have also looked at the, the uh, chambers from the standpoint of um, how to help uh, with the recarpeting and, and some of the other issues that need to take place and so we're, we're working on including those in the planning. Thank you. So on to the schedule for the future. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the first item that uh, I'd like to um, inform you of is the, uh, the plan for the, uh, the stone installation. We're looking at a three-phase 
plan where the uh, you can see the 2013 plan will take care of the northeast portion. The 2014 will then take place over on the northwest corner uh, corners of the building, and then 2015 will finish up with the uh, the south side. Um, this is these are the areas where scaffolding will will be for a period of time as they go through and replace the stone and repoint and and bring that up to um, uh, kind of a, a longevity opportunity and repair. Um, the overall schedule, as I mentioned, we've hired um, J.E. Dunn as the construction manager. And one of the benefits of having a contractor involved in this phase is that we're able to go through and very carefully look at the scheduling process and how we're going to um, work in the building. One of the real tricky parts of this process is the the need to keep the building open so that uh, the sessions can occur on time and and that leaves us a very tight window of opportunity for work and so we're looking at how do we phase that how do we organize that um, and so what we are have come up with thus far and I will tell you that that as we learn new information things change this is about the fourth or fifth schedule that we've put together looking at the phasing diagrams in the master plan we looked at a, a, a at one type of a, a phasing system we then were asked to go back and look at a horizontal type of phasing system we're, we're, we're trying to find the right one and so the process of, of div, uh, discovering new information and gaining information as we talk to tenants and, and uh, representatives and senators and and others helps us and informs us as to how the process may go together. So at the current time, we're looking at the first package occurring uh, this year, which would be the abatement and demolition in the basement and the attic. Uh, we would not be doing any abatement or any demolition um, in 2013 in the uh, uh, areas of the ground floor to the third floor. Uh, we would also like to begin the package uh, two work, which is the MEP preparation and installation, which would run from 2014 to 2016. So those two phases are the phases that we would be looking at for the $109 million that we're, we're asking for. And it's important that we obligate that money and, and um, uh, move forward so that we have the mechanical contractors and others on board to to move forward. And would you identify MEP? MEP, mechanical, electrical, and, and uh, plumbing. The, um, the, the construction phases for three and four become a little bit more. Rip of Detmer has a question. This might you know, not be on the committee, uh, Madam Chair, is just a, a question. What would happen if uh, we were only in session for you know, one year, well, one year session, so we weren't in session for a year. What, what, what would that do, the construction, and, uh, how would, and how would we save costs, too? Mr. Hart. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative. That, that's a great question. Um, in, in our initial discussions with the Capital Preservation Commission, we suggested that maybe everybody move out. <laughs> that building <laughs> didn't go over very well, but I, I can tell you from the experience we had in um, Utah when we did the capital there, we did relocate everybody out of the capital. Um, we were able to we had we had a much different situation. Now keep in mind we had to basically hold the capital in place and remove all of the footings and foundations from the building, put it on base isolation, and then put all the footings and foundations back. And so that was a huge safety risk to have anybody in the building. And so that helped us because we were able to push everybody out of the building. Um, because of the mechanical and electrical systems that are really the driving force of yours, it is possible to kind of work around things and there will be um, limited safety issues that we will take um, steps to keep from becoming problems. But the ideal scenario honestly would be to have people vacate the building. So your idea of not having session would make everybody's life much better. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> that's not what we've been asked to do. But, but just out of curiosity, just to follow up on his question, what year would that be? Well, um, the best year would be 
the session in 2014 because we were hoping that that would be a short session. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the response I got in the Senate. So, <laughs> you know, the the idea would be the 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 need really is that once we start in the in the chambers, that's where we see the greatest amount of time being consumed. And the reason for that is there's, there's flooring that has to be dealt with, electronics that has to be dealt with. And, and the way we're looking at it now is that in, in one year we're going to be able to do the flooring and the electronics and then we have to reset everything back up so that you can hold session. And then we have to take everything back down so that we can then do the walls and the lighting above you. So it's going to be like a half and half deal. If, if and when we start work in the chambers, if we could just take that and move all the way through to the end, that would be the ideal because then we're not mobilizing and demobilizing and then remobilizing. And that's where you spend the money um, is in the mobilization cost. So if we could eliminate that, the work wouldn't be any less expensive, but the time in there would be less time overall and that would be less expensive. Um, and so there are some potential savings that could be applied to that yeah. and ways to look at that. But it, it does put a burden on, on you as representatives as to how you deal with that. Now, one last thing and then I, I'll, I'll stop. The, the, the issue really is how do we then deal with special sessions? And that's going to be an issue that we're going to have to look at regardless of whether we're doing it one way or the other because if you do go into a special session then where do you go how do you function and how do you how do you do what you need to do? Just, just a quick follow. It, you know, if we did, we're able to do, uh, not have a session for a year. Uh, what type of savings are we talking about? You know, that might be hard to answer right now, but what kind of savings are we talking about? Mr. Hart. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative. I um, I don't have those numbers now, but I'll I'll ask the um, the the uh, uh, construction manager to put something together, and then we'll provide that to the chair. Thank you. Except Carlson? Yeah, I, I wasn't going to go in that direction initially, but because <clears throat> I have a different question, but um, I was here when we uh, remodeled uh, yeah, this sir. building and we redid uh, a number of years ago the House Chambers. And uh, House members were officed in the old Mechanic Arts High School, which is now where the Judiciary Building is. My office was one of the assistant principal's offices. I remember that. It was kind of a bare bones place. It had been closed for some time, and they uh, took it out of uh, being mothballed, and that's where we were. And then we, uh, I've got a picture somewhere where House members are in the Senate chambers while the House chambers was being done during, I think it was a special session, and two House members sitting side by side at one Senate desk. So there were things that were done that uh, were rather temporary, but. Uh, did uh, create uh, a minimal amount of inconvenience at the time, but this building was completely vacated for, for that re, uh, remodeling. But my question, uh, Madam Chair, is um, of Mr. Hart, and you referenced the basement and the mechanical, and I remember some of the earlier plans, there were other things that were going to be down there, and currently, uh, after the mechanical part and that space is taken, uh, what is still available and what's going to go in that uh, space? Mr. Hart. Madam Chair and uh, Representative, thank you for the, the question. If you look in the, the diagrams we provided in the upper right-hand corner, uh, the area in green in the, in the basement is, are the areas that we are identifying as the mechanical um, functions. Um, we're combining a, a number of mechanical functions that are on both the north and the south side all to the north side. The reason for the north side is that's where the service comes in. It's virtually a dark side because it's buried into the hillside, um, so to speak. And the southern side, there is a potential for windows along the, um, the, uh, the stone wall. In fact, there are openings presently that have been um, utilized by the mechanical system to provide for air intakes. Those can be opened up and, and windows can be um, placed in there. So all of the white area or the uh, area that has not been colored is available for um, circulation space and for occupancy. Uh, we are looking at a number of different, different needs from the press to uh, different offices of maybe the Senate or the, 
the uh, the House. We're not recommending that maybe senators go in the basement, but some of their staff might. Uh, maybe the governor's office has some space down there. So it, it would have to be a variety of things to take care of that. We also know that the the House has certain storage requirements where they can off-site <coughs> store some things, but there are some on-site things that they have to store, and so we need to make sure that we provide that as well. Okay, so Madam Chair, it sounds process. like that's yet to be determined just exactly how that space would be configured and used. But that is I, correct. I assume it's in the price estimates to do yes. some things. Yes. Okay, thank you. Representative Earhart? Well, Madam Chair, I was just wondering, uh, what if you close one chamber completely uh, on alternate years? Mr. Hart. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Representative. We are studying that. Um, we have started discussions with both the House and the Senate um, administration with regards to how that might occur so that if, in fact, there is a special session, at least we have one chamber open. Um, there is no resolution to that discussion at this point in time, but, but we have begun that discussion. Well, Madam Chair, on, aside from that, Dittmer is fool, Representative Dittmer is fooling with my per diem, and I don't like that. <laughs> uh, Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, I'm jumping a couple uh, sheets ahead here, but uh, the uh, the request I I believe for this year is 109 million, and then uh, what was it? 94.5 in uh, 2000 for our fourth fiscal year 2015. Uh, I'm just wondering. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I got this question in here today. How how critical it is that we continue the the restoration process as it's currently scheduled. Uh, you know, you said for 28 years we've been talking about this, and you know I've been here for you know 10 years, seeing the will of the legislature ebb and flow on this issue and plans come and go and uh, just wondering how, how important it is uh, for this building, our capital, that we stay on the schedule. And that's a good intro to your last two pages, I think. Yes, thank you. Um, Madam Chair and Representative, thank you for the, the question. You're at, um, you're, you're at kind of a, a tipping point, so to speak. With, with the building, um, and that is that the mechanical systems are really worn out. The electrical systems are um, no longer really organized. It, it seems to be as something new is needed, some electrical line or, or wire is run, and they don't deal with the old ones. And so there's a variety of issues that are around there. We don't have sufficient power in the building. And, and I think what happens if we don't move forward with the restoration is that things are going to get to the point where you are constantly going to be in a state of continually having to fund something to keep the building moving. Whether that is stone, whether that is windows, whether it's the artwork or the, the uh, murals on the wall, uh, the mechanical system or the electrical, you're, you're in a position where um, if you look at many of the buildings in Europe that weren't taken care of properly, they're never going to work their way out of those buildings. And it, it, you don't want that to happen to this building. And I, and I think it's absolutely critical that you move forward at this time um, with, the, with the plan that we're proposing. The $109 million allows us to do uh, the work that really sets up the, the restoration work in the body of the building, which is the phases three and four. Um, however that gets structured, it, it'll be critical to get the mechanical systems put in place and um, the electrical systems put in place. The $109 million gives us the opportunity to do the obligation that we need to with the mechanical contractors and the electrical contractors. It allows us to buy the long lead items. It allows us to move the project forward. Um, the remaining amount of money that would come in the following year is likewise equally as critical so that we can keep that process going. Any stop or hiccup is only going to cause additional costs and additional problems in, in time and, and in work. Um, with that said, I think it's very important that you understand that we are being very, very cost conscious as we're going through this process. At the end of every workshop, we have the contractor go through and do a complete new budget. We then look at that budget as it relates to the things that we have talked about 
and what we talked about in the previous workshop and we compare those two budgets together and then we reconcile those so that we're still on budget. And so you can see on the graphic before you the, the workshops two, three, and four and how they have varied and how they have been reconciled. We are currently at the end of our workshop for the reconciliation, we are $7,300 below the budget. And that'll go up and down over the course of the project. But at the end of every workshop, um, for example, tomorrow we will meet with them and talk about workshop five and reconcile that number and decide what is in and what can be out and how that budget is to hold. Because these budgets can get out of hand very quickly and so we want to make sure that we manage this project to the budget. This is the same process we used in Salt Lake in Utah that delivered that project actually below budget. Um, with regards to the, the funding request, we are asking for $109 million this year. That will go for abatement, demolition, exterior stone replacement, room, it'll, uh, uh, roof, I'm sorry. Um, the mechanical electrical plumbing systems uh, will be able to become uh, obligated and will have the opportunity to start the, the process of buying out that work and, and getting those in, uh, uh, subcontractors on board as well as providing for the swing space and making sure that we have the ability to move people in and out of the building. Perfect. And then Spitsinski, you had a question earlier and I didn't recognize you. Um, did you did you still No, I'm okay. Okay. Yep. okay. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's that's just fine. And then the, uh, the final request would come the following year for $94.5 million and that would then allow us to finish up the, the restoration. And members, I, I've been kind of the, the prickly mosquito for a number of years and have fought all sorts of uh, components of this and, and, and you know, dr kind of driving down costs and t questioning, do you really have to take uh, the whole building apart uh, to replace uh, mechanicals? But um, now, We've been at this so long that I am just, uh, to your question or your comment, Representative Erdahl, I am just um, um, now a proponent to say in the next two years, we've got to get these done, 109 this year and 94.5 next year, because if you went into another legislative session, you'd have a whole, potentially another whole different group of legislators, and, and you'd start this process over about explaining this to everybody. <laughs> Uh, and so, I mean, I think there does come a time when, when you say, okay, because, you know, the, the, there is the potential, if inflation returns, um, these, these costs change dramatically and quickly. Yes. And so um, uh, that we are this far along, um, I, I would be a strong proponent of, of saying this is, this is our challenge now, 109 this year and 94.5 next year. And then um, we're, we're done. Representative Carlson. Yeah, just to follow up on the uh, <clears throat> discussion about where people would go and, you know, I referenced right in the Capitol complex there was a former high school, but when we talk about swing space, um, has anybody been looking at um, facilities that uh, are somewhat close to the Capitol that could accommodate uh, the legislature and other state agencies uh, on a temporary basis? Mr. That was just a target of opportunity when we just happened to have mechanical high Wayne school. Wayne um, from the Department of Administration. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Wayne Wislowski. I'm the Senior Director for Real Estate and Construction Services within the Department of Administration. Um, and thank you, Representative Carlson, for the question. Um, we've looked at a, a number of, as we're meeting with the tenants to uh, talk about their long-term space needs, we're also talking about, you know, what they can live with during construction mm -hmm. to still and still do the work that they, they need to get done. Um, for example, yesterday we met with the, the, the press and tried to understand um, currently how they work in the building and, and what they need as far as access and telecommunications to be able to do their uh, job for the public. Um, within uh, one of the ideas with starting in the basement in the Capitol, is to first think of that as potentially you saw everything on the south portion of that uh, of the basement is is really going to be opened up for potentially for office and, and storage uses. So one of the ideas is to use that as as swing space internal to the building. 
So we finish that space first in a, put the mechanical systems in and then finish that space in a temporary manner and then we use that as, as swing space within the building. We're gonna look at other areas within the building itself. Um, you know, one of the conversations we have to have is, is regarding the Supreme Court chambers and could that potentially function as a hearing room space um, as we're going through the, the process. Um, so that's the starting point. And then obviously with the connection with the state office building, um, for example, we've uh, looked at the cafeteria um, in, in the state office building as underutilized and as potentially an opportunity to repurpose that during construction. Um, and that could be serve a variety of, of needs. Um, some things on the, criti the critical path for um, uh, swing space, if you think of the, the, the function of Senate and, and House media and, and, and some of the broadcast work they do, um, refining, you'll, we only want to move them once. So figuring out where they're gonna go um, because that's an expensive uh, uh, move um, and it's also disruptive. Um, you know, when, when can we get that done? So that's something we're studying today is where would they go? If they're gonna stay in the Capitol building, where would they go? And you know, are there other locations? Um, you know, house meeting, I know um, they're present here today. Um, you know, there's obviously a strong connection with, with the state office building and would that function be better served over in the state office building. Now, where do we find the space here? So those are, you know, there's dominoes effects to these, these conversations. Um, we're also looking at Centennial office building. Um, we, um, we're currently in the process of leasing a new data center uh, for, for the state and that's gonna free up uh, the data center that's currently on the fifth floor of the Centennial office building and looking to then repurpose that space and that certainly could serve as as swing space in, in the interim. There's some other pockets of space around the campus. For example, um, CAP security. Um, uh, uh, Major Meyerson has indicated that it's, uh, their function would be best served in many cases outside of the Capitol building um, so that they could react better to any uh, situations that are happening in the Capitol building. Um, there's some space in the, in the basement of the admin building that used to be a data center that's now vacant that, that we could repurpose for them and we think that's gonna work out uh, quite nicely. So looking at a variety of options, um, quite honestly, we're even looking at temporary trailers um, for potentially the, uh, the press. That was a conversation we had with them. If, if we could locate that with its uh, close access to the tunnel system, uh, could we use temporary trailers? And I would just say it's not just about office space, it's, it, it's about storage, it's also about parking. Um, as we're doing the exterior stone repairs and, and the interior restoration at the same time, the staging that we need to do that work is substantial. Um, so um, we've, we've put everything on the table, and including um, you know looking at uh, um, expanding lot D, which is the, the, the lot next to the um, the, the state office building parking ramp to accommodate next to where the light rail station is. And those aren't gonna be popular, that's not gonna be a popular discussion because we're gonna be impacting potentially green space um, to use for temporary parking. So it's also looking outside to other, um, you know, there's some state office space, or there's some private office space around the area that potentially could work as well. Um, it really gets, you know, there's some fundamental th questions first on once we get the schedule set and understand, have everybody agree on how the schedule is going to work, that's going to really drive when we need to bring up swing space, including as uh, Mr. Hart mentioned, on you know what's our plans for if we get into a special session situation and how do we accommodate that? Well, it looks, uh, Madam Chair, like a lot is being done in that regard. In fact, when you mentioned the Capitol complex, uh, a couple of things came to my mind. Um, you know, there's a couple of rooms in the state uh, or in the uh, courts building that would have some potential, uh, the veterans building. When you mentioned lunchrooms underutilized, they're not the most convenient, obviously, but we're gonna have to experience some inconvenience when we go through this process to, to get it done in a timely manner. So, thank you. We do keep raising the Ford building, too, always on wondering whether there aren't some potential. Uh, Madam Chair, that's a good point. I mean, that's uh, many, many members feel strongly about 
for building one way or the other. We get both sides of that the, that conversation. Um, obviously, the current condition of that building is you know it's it needs there's no mechanical systems in there. It's not heated. Um, we got the, it's falling apart. Um, so you, to fix that building up, you'd have to think of of a long term use as well to make that um, a worthwhile investment. Representative Earhart. Uh, thank you. This is a little off the subject, but since you're the senior uh, director of real estate, has any thought been given to uh, wrestling some of that land from Sears, all of it they're going to go into, high rise, whatever over there? Mr. Wyslowski? Madam Chair, Representative, you probably just triggered another hearing. Um, they, <laughs> they, they've actually um, submitted redevelopment plans. Uh, for that site to to the city of St. Paul and and also to the cap board and and they got uh, preliminary pr approval on their concept. Um, you may know that they've um, created an internal division in Sears now that is focused on maximizing their real estate portfolio across the country, um, and they've targeted eight sites and this is one of their first eight. Um, so we've uh, we currently have at least 630. Uh, stalls uh, from them that lease expires in August of this coming year. Uh, we're currently negotiating and trying to get an extension on on that lease, um, but you know, we will be quickly having a conversation with this committee about parking on the campus um, and in long-term uh, parking. But they will be looking at private development. They've talked about it, including it's a mixed-use development where there'll be office space component. Um, Early conversations with them, or they're going to be a bit out of our price range, but maybe government relations folks. Um, obviously, the, comp the office market in St. Paul is very competitive uh, for from a rental rate. So, come bringing on new construction of Class A office spaces, they're going to be charging a uh, a premium for that space, and and you know that'll be a consideration. You know, the proximity to the capital versus right. versus the rates that. We can get all elsewhere. Well, yeah, sure. I was interested in it. if we're going to expand the campus, which we seem to be doing all the time. The actual ownership of that, some or all of that. Are you thinking about that, or Madam Mr. Chair? Lasky. Madam Chair, Representative Verdor, I, I, quite honestly, I think that ship has has sailed with with, with light rail coming in, and just the uh, that that it would be very expensive. I guess is the best way to say it. That 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 real estate has become quite valuable. Um, and Sear certainly sees it as an opportunity for them to do their own development. So now they're thinking that they're going to make some money on on that. So that's going to be pretty expensive real estate. It's a good point that we are, you know, we're our our available land is is pretty limited. You know, even for the temporary parking, we're talking about green spaces being impacted uh, to to deal with that. I see no further questions. If you have some concluding, does any of you have? Concluding uh, remarks. Madam Chair, members, I just sure? appreciate the opportunity to provide this background for many of the new members that didn't have necessarily the history about the preservation efforts that have gone on to date. Um, as many of you have heard, uh, this has been a decades-long effort and with very little to show for it. And so finally, um, with the allocation of the $44 million last year and the continued effort that we're putting into the process right now, um, we really believe that this is our opportunity, this is our chance uh, to make this investment in the next 100 years of Minnesota. Uh, Mr. Hart. Madam Chair and members, I, I just want to offer an invitation that if you have questions or if you have any um, thing that uh, comes to mind after this meeting or if you're talking to your colleagues and they have any questions, uh, please call us. Uh, please, uh, uh, Madam Chair knows uh, knows how to get a hold of me. <laughs> We've had several conversations. and. Um, uh, we'd be more than happy to come over and sit down and visit with you and, and talk to you extensively about your concerns or your issues. We want this to be an open process, and, and uh, we want to make sure that your voices are heard. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I um, neglected to uh, um, move the minutes or approve the minutes of um, Tuesday, January 29th. Representative Detmer. Madam Chair, I, I do move. And uh, any changes, additions, corrections, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Those minutes are approved. And our next meeting members, um, Jay Coles, who is with the Itasca Project, that's a group of the kind of the major businesses, Wells Fargo and others. Um, 
is going to make a presentation on their uh, um, return on investment um, study. And uh, also here with us, I believe, uh, will be the three major cha chambers in the metro area, St. Paul Area Chamber, Greater Minneapolis, and Twin West. Uh, and that will be our next uh, presentation on the issue of transit corridor investment. So uh, no further uh, questions. We are adjourned.